All right, it's 20 after, so let's begin, because, you know, technically we start at quarter after. But I know, just like church, right? The bell's ringing, pastor's walking up to the front, people keep coming in right behind him. <laughs> We've uh, tried to read this chapter a few times now, and uh, we get a little distracted, but the reason is... Dorothy. Dorothy. The reason is, um, I think it's actually probably one of the most significant sections in the book, if not the most significant. And so we're going to dig into it again today, and this time we're going to read, and uh, hopefully that will um, provide us some conversation. But but don't be ashamed, or don't be uh, discouraged, or uh, whatever. Um, I don't mind, actually, if especially if the text leads us to a conversation that needs to be had. We have that conversation regardless of whether it's what we planned or it's, it keeps us from going as far as maybe as we'd like to go in the text. That's actually perfectly fine. None of us are in hurry. Okay, so uh, if you don't have the last couple weeks, so there's two handouts on this chapter in part uh, from the 3rd and from the 10th as the dates that are listed on there. And then on the 10th, we went back to the handout from the 10th, on the 17th, went back to the handout for the 10th, and then we didn't actually talk too much about what's on there either. Or that's actually what we did on the 17th. Okay, so let's, let's actually read chapter 43. And if you remember, he's already gotten his big tour of the temple. Uh, and this is not just any temple, but it's the eternal temple, the heavenly temple, as it's depicted to him uh, in vision. There we go. You can hear the church. So let's read. Yeah. Uh, Maybe the first five verses is a good place to start. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate facing east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the east, and the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters. And the earth shone with his glory. And the vision I saw was like the vision which I had seen, and he came to destroy the city. And like the vision, vision which I had seen by the river Kabar, and I fell upon my face. As the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. All right. Uh, so if you remember from the handout from the 26th of November, <laughs> sorry, I'm referring back, the one with all the maps, if you still have that, the, the east gate. Um, you know, there's no gate on the west. So the gate that faces the east, that's the main entrance into the outer court, into the inner court, into the uh, holy place. All right, so this is the main entrance. We talked about east and west and, and daybreak, right? Um, the one thing that's really significant here, of course, is the glory of the, of the God of Israel, that long form. Um, this is, it's okay that we actually got stuck on this because... There's so much here that's relevant to what, we've, what happens at Christmas with the nativity. So the glory of the Lord shone about them, right? What was that? That's with the shepherds, yeah, and the angels, uh, which is the text for uh, 10 o'clock tonight for when, when you uh, wake up from your slumber, take about an hour nap, and then come to church, right? <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Eh, well, so it is. Um, so yes, the glory of the Lord, and that's what the angel messenger, the Malak Yahweh, which is, um, should be a little bit surprising to you because that, as we talked about in our catechesis this week, that only happened previously. The angel and the glory together at the burning bush. Yeah, at the burning bush. Which is where the divine name was given to Moses to say, who sh- when he asked, who should I say sent me? I am. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which, uh, when we study that, I try to assert for you that that is, there's different ways to say it. The pre-incarnate Christ, that's not so helpful. Um, the word not yet made flesh would be another way to say it. You know, because on Christmas Day, we're going to hear from John 1, the word made flesh, and the word became, or, how's, how do we say it? Yeah. And dwelt among us. And, dwelt among us. Ah. and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. So the diff- distinction between Jesus and what's happening here is the flesh and blood taking on human flesh. That's the distinction. But it's the same person visiting. 
The same person that visited Moses at the burning bush is the same person that's speaking to Ezekiel here from the heavenly dwellings is the same person that appeared um, before, before us in the manger. And then it gets a little confusing with the shepherds because it may be the same person that's announcing his birth to the shepherds, even while he's human flesh in the manger. And then you get into that long and difficult conversation of how, can, how, does, how is it that he's man, but he doesn't seem to be limited in the way that we are as man. Well, it's because he's also true God, right? And so the things that only God can do, Jesus can do in his flesh and blood, like appear to more than one person at the same time. Uh, mostly throughout his ministry, he doesn't do that. But after his resurrection, uh, even St. Saint, Saint Paul asserts, I think in 1 Corinthians, right, that uh, he appeared to 500 at, this, at once. Yeah, and we don't even know what he's referring to because we don't have the historic account of what that is. All right, so we have the glory of the Lord facing east. His voice, so now, oh, first we behold, so he's seeing it. So a glory, of course, you're going to see a glory. Um, you have this note about the gate that's facing east, so that's a hint as to what's coming. We have, a, we have facing, which is, of course, a, a verb, but it could be also a noun, right? The glory of God, which we behold, and then a voice, and the voice like the sound of many waters. How is that familiar? Yeah, you're thinking maybe of like when the voice sounded from heaven and they said they thought it sounded like it thundered. No, I've heard this. Hmm. Did they say it earlier in Ezekiel? What do you think? Say, is there is there a part of might not be the voice of God? Yeah, it was Ezekiel one. So there you are. And I think we talked about this when we introduced this section back at the end of November, that. Um, this, these first 13 verses draw together both what came before and what's coming. So that's why I said it's pretty significant. Yeah, when, when they went, this is the first vision of heaven that Ezekiel has. I heard the noise of their wings. This is the wings of the angels. Like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult. So the, 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 the wings is like the voice of the Almighty. Well, here... The Almighty Voice speaks, and it is like the wings of the angels. Um, I, I think I recalled the story back when we looked at Ezekiel 1. I don't know. That was a year ago, so who even knows? Um, what's that time when, they're, when the, the, the angels are in the trees? Old Testament story. And the trees are rustling, and it causes a tumult. Mm, that's a deep cut. Figure out what battle that was. Um, it's one. Of, it's with Joshua. I can't remember which one. All right. Oh yeah, there it is. The voice recalls the sound. It's in the first paragraph. The wings of chapter one, verse twenty-four, along with the themes of light and fire. Right. So then he recalls the appearance of the vision which he had previously saw when he came to destroy the city. And I think that was in. Uh, well, he didn't come to destroy the city. The angel did. But regardless, that was back in twelve. I think no nine. Chapter 9 of Ezekiel, where he prophetically spoke of the destruction of the city uh, before it happened. And then the visions were like the vision I saw by the river, river Kabar. So that's again pointing us back to the beginning of the book when he was sitting by the river. And remember, he had uh, that's where he was doing all the pantomime, I guess, <laughs> with the little city and baking the, the bread on the human excrement and all of that. Your Ezekiel bread isn't as uh, pleasant as the bakeries like you to believe. And uh, anyway, he fell on his face. Uh, now, of course, you fall on your face only before your Lord, right? Um, if it's an angel, and you see this in Revelation, the angel will say, no, stand up. All right? Um, but here, he's falling before, and he's not going to be told to stand up. So he's right in understanding that he is in the presence of the Almighty. But of course, you have the glory, and you have the voice. <laughs> so what, what more do you need, right? Right? Right. Okay. I know it's 8.30. Everybody's getting their mind in gear. Yeah, pastor too. What? And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate, which faces toward the east. So now he's on the east gate. The glory is facing him, but then the glory goes into the temple. Of course, it's going to draw him in. He's going to follow the glory into the temple. This is significant because you remember the glory of the Lord had departed from the temple previously. 
Uh, when was that? Did I write that down? The glory of the Lord entered the temple. Did I write down when it left the temple? I think that was in chapter 9 as well, wasn't it? Or maybe it was 11. I think it was 11. So, um, no glory in the temple means no presence of God dwelling in the temple. This is important because the tabernacle and the temple were the visible sign of God's presence with his people. Okay? Uh, That's fine. This was established before. We've talked about this before with Moses. Remember when Moses is on the mountain? There's fire and smoke on the mountain, but the people think that God has departed them. He's on the mountain. He's not with them because Moses is not with them. So until the tabernacle is established, their understanding of God's presence with them is by way of the mediator or the deliverer. Or you could really call Moses the savior. So then that ends up becoming a picture of Christ in the end, right? Where, how do we know that Jesus is with us? It's by his word, namely the word that saves. I forgive you your sins. Uh, This is important because truly, I think I wrote this somewhere on the sheet. God is with us every, you know, he's in everything. He's, He's in all and through all and under all and Right? All things are made through him, and not anything was made that was not made through him. Meaning he is, he is connected intimately to every fabric of creation, even the crayon that Patrick's coloring with. Um, but is he there for you to save you? And so this is an important distinction we make, right? Uh, where do we go to actually meet Jesus? Do we try to meet him in the air? This is to Vicky's email to me. Sorry to pick on you, Vicky, again. I picked on you in the sermon on Wednesday. I kind of felt bad about that. I brought up something you said to me and acknowledged that you said it. And usually I say, as somebody said to me, all right, so Vicki sent me an email about, about how they want to control us from space with uh, technology, the big, because they, they can have infinite power and, uh, you know, from solar and uh, transmit that power and have a whole big control grid from space, which maybe is what SpaceX actually is and, uh, and Starlink. Um, I don't trust Elon Musk. You shouldn't either. Because he's, he's a smooth talker. He's a double talker. He's a fork tongue. That's what they call it in the Bible. He says two things at the same time, depending on who he's talking to. Those are people you can't trust. He says, it to, says the, what you want to hear, and he also says what they want to hear. Hmm. Plus, he made all of his money from the military. So, anyway. Uh, what were we saying? Oh, yes. Controlling us from space, right? But do we go to space to find Jesus? Yeah, maybe space is the dwelling place. Maybe the atmosphere is the dwelling place of the, of the angels and the demons, right? I mean, that's how the Bible describes it. It's actually not a bad way to think about it, that the spiritual realities are above us, uh, because that's the way the Bible describes it. And maybe we don't actually belong there then. Maybe that is the dwelling place for them and not for us. We belong on the earth, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, what was I bringing this up? That Yeah, we don't go there to find God because... God has not, been, has not promised that you can find him there with forgiveness, life, and salvation. Right? Whereas he promised to give you that. It's through his word preached and taught here on earth. All right? So that's the, uh, and specifically in his church. Why did I bring this up? Oh, yes, following his glory where he's promised to be found. Right? So Ezekiel's going to follow the glory because the glory is the presence of God. And he wants to be in God's presence. Even though he's fearful of it, at the, you know, he bowed on his face. At the same time, there, there's actually no, there's no greater, I think, descriptor of hell is that God is not with you, right? If God withdraws from you, not only saving you from your sins, so leaving you with your sins, that's the worst part, but even just think of it this way, if he withdraws daily bread from you, so peace, health, protection, uh, food, clothing, shoes, drink, you know, devout husband or wife, devout children, good government, good weather, all of that. If he withdraws all of that from you, <laughs> what does that sound like? That sounds like hell too, doesn't it? Fire and brimstone, death. Yeah. All right. So follow the glory where it goes. And that's, you know, if Jesus is the glory incarnate, then follow Jesus where he's promised to be. Um, yeah. I know a verse I was thinking about regarding something in the water. It was Revelation 1. Oh, yes. Yeah, so we've talked about this before too. Revelation 21, 22. But now Revelation 1, we have... This is, this the, is well, and it also explains why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians that his voice is like the sound of an archangel, right? So again, the, 
I don't even know what the sound of angel flapping wings is, but apparently it's the sound of the Almighty. And it doesn't, a mumbling roar. By the a mumbling roar. Okay, there you go. So uh, look at the second paragraph on the handout. Ezekiel writes in the first person to describe his reaction and recollection of the two previous encounters with the same theophany, that's a big word, but uh, phonos is a Greek word that you hear every year after Christmas because the, on the 12th day of Christmas, no, on the 13th day of Christmas, my true love gave to me the epiphany of our Lord or something like that. I'll make up a new stanza. Epiphany, right? Epiphanos. Phonos is just the word for light. So a theophany is actually a revealing of God, the, theos. So God reveals himself all throughout the Old Testament in very, many and various ways. And then as the writer of Hebrews says, now in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. All right. Somebody had their hand up? I thought I saw a hand. No? All right. These encounters affirm the power and efficacy of the preached word of God in harmony with what Jesus declares in the New Testament about absolution and the office of the keys. Lo, I'm with you always, right? Ezekiel has a momentary flashback to his first encounter with the glory, and his reaction is almost verbatim identical. That's from uh, Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 3. He shows the same awe and submission, even though almost 20 years have intervened since. All right, so 20 years later, the same thing ha something similar happens, and he responds the same way. And then, as we note, um, if the glory of the Lord is the revelation of the Son, then we also have the Spirit, uh, which means... Well, we have the voice, that's the Son, and the glory of the Father is in the Son, and then, of course, the Spirit. So this is a Trinitarian revelation, too, in the Old Testament. So you don't have to wait till the New Testament to, to see the Trinity. I mean, you, you can get it right away in Genesis 1 as well, right? Because um, the Spirit of God hovers over the face of the deep, and the, God spoke the, the Son. Once again, we meet the Spirit, third paragraph, the third person of the Trinity, who's able to transport the prophet to different locality, which is bizarre, but we've, we looked at that already. Chapter 3, chapter 8, chapter 11. Ezekiel gets teleported, you know, Star Trek style, uh, somewhere. It happens with both Philip and Paul. Uh, it, that's true. It does happen in Acts. Good point. Yeah, Philip finds himself somewhere else, carried away by the Spirit. And you're like, what? What chapter is that in? Uh, is it before Stephen? It might be like six, seven, eight, somewhere in there. No, it's towards the beginning. It's in the first 11 or so chapters. Philip gets taken away by the Spirit to another place. And you're like, um, meaning like the Spirit spoke to him and said, go? Or the Spirit picked him up and set him down somewhere else? <laughs> that hasn't happened to me yet. Has that happened to any of you yet? I know sometimes you go on a long road trip and you forget driving. Does that ever happen? You just like, or especially, it's not even a lo long road trip. Maybe the, the drive to work and you get distracted thinking about something and then all of a sudden you're there and you're like, I don't remember actually leaving. Yeah, okay. It's not just me. All right. Uh, this is, but this is actually supernatural. And then uh, we should talk about this because it, it, it's really the antecedent or the, the text that comes before is the glory of the Lord appearing in the temple has happened twice before. And again, it's the sign that God is showing his favor on his people and that he's actually dwelling with them, both in the tabernacle and then the dedication of the temple by Solomon. Those are the two big texts. And I gave you the references there. Um, Exodus 40. I mean, it's, I'm only going to give you a couple of verses so we can go look at it. And it, these are both particularly relevant to tomorrow morning uh, with Christmas Day. The cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Right? So this was a sign. And of course, what was it that actually led the people of Israel through the wilderness? Pillar of fire and pillar of cloud, right. Or Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, right? If Jesus is the glory of God, in human flesh, as John asserts in John 1, then it was Jesus who was leaving them by way of Moses. All right. And then at the dedication of the temple, uh, they changed the software and I always push the wrong button now. Don't ever change software. Then the pastor doesn't know what to do. I think they thought it would make it easier, but motor memory, right? So here they've got the whole um, temple set up. This is Solomon. 
You know, David started building it, but then Solomon completed it. Um, notice too in verse four, this is going to come up today. They brought the, up the ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of meeting and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. So when they dedicate the temple, they bring the tabernacle as well. Cause it's gonna, there's a handoff if you like, right? Uh, including the ark of the covenant and the priests and Levites brought them up. Also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel were assembled with him, were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitude. So that was a pretty bloody day. Then the priest brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place into the inner sanctuary of the temple to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. So you remember the Ark itself has a lid with cherubim on it, but then within the most holy place of the temple are very large statues of cherub, cherubim with wings overshadowing again the Ark. Remember how tall they were? Like 10 cubits or something, right? 18 feet, 20 feet. Either 10 or 12. All right, you can go look that up if you want. It might be helpful. Then the priest brought in the ark, we said, under the wings of the cherubim. Cherubim spring the two wings over the place of the ark. Cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. The poles extended um, so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place. So, I mean, there, there's a curtain, but then the poles actually are kind of sticking out. You can still see. So you would know the ark is in there. And there they are to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb, which the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. So apparently the manna that had been saved in a jar in there, that's gone now. Somebody ate it. Somebody ate it. Yeah. That old stale bread. And then look, verse 10. It came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud and the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon spoke of that building, but I think prophetically of Christ. The Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell in forever. So it's a little bit of a double entendre, not intended by Solomon. But of course, who's in the loins of Solomon? Jesus, so, you know, eventually, he's actually, of his, from his flesh will come the, uh, the, the true temple, Jesus in his body. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like until coming here, I never saw Jesus so clearly in the Old Testament. I, mm. I just don't feel like it's so widely taught. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, is that a newer thing, or did people nope. used to see Jesus in the Old Testament? Okay. Yep. So when did it change? Yeah, for us in our tradition, it came, uh, well, we had the initial reform movement, um, which, which it's, it, it's all over in, in Luther and Melanchthon and, and then in the second generation of Chemnitz and uh, just pick, pick your Gerhardt and the others. When you get to the golden age of Orthodoxy, which is then about 100 years later, it's, it's, it's even more richly developed. You mean Jesus in the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and they're just pulling from the page, uh, from the um, what's called the patristics, the church fathers, because they're doing it all the time. The apostles do it. Paul does it um, in Jesus Galatians and Romans. Well, and Jesus does it too. Yeah, with Elijah and Moses. This is the sermon today, so you're you're oh. you're you're getting right. Okay. Actually, it's probably once I finish tonight. I haven't finished tonight yet. Because um, I kind of changed gears at the last minute, this happens. Uh, Maybe all three sermons for today. Are you but, mentioning it? Just... No. But um, <laughs> but here here's what happens. Uh, Lutherans are responsible for some of the, the greatest like um, like reclamations of biblical orthodoxy and teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, like bringing the church fathers back to bear, for example. Um, the medieval Roman Church was didn't really care so much about. The, the first four centuries of the church. They didn't read them, hmm. right? Um, part of that is because Lutherans are also children of the, of the uh, Renaissance. And that was part of the Renaissance. Is go, let's go back to the text, back to the, back to the font, back to the, to the source, ad fontis. Yeah, let's go back to the source. Let's read, let's read the, not only read the scriptures again, because we hadn't been doing that, rather than derivative works, but then the, let's read the first generation, second generation, um, and there was a great movement afoot to try to rebuild the libraries and, and find the old manuscripts, um, not only of the scriptures, but of other people too. So, so part of that was just happening at the same time. Uh, then something happened, uh, and it, it's largely 
Well, it's just called the enlightenment, but it's not being enlightened by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's self-illumination. So now it's, we call it the age of reason, I think, in uh, philosophy. So, Aren't understanding sure. much of it. Right. Right. And, and part of that is that, as Jesus says, you need a guide. Mm-hmm. Right? I, uh, and some of, you know, it could just be actually just reading with friends or with your family. And, and your children may actually, because they're not as hamstrung by, by, by their brains like you are, that they're more interested. I mean, they're creative and. Not the, I'm not looking at you guys, but you're going to college now, so your brains are being slowly killed over four years. Um, what was I? No, I mean, they're willing to go places that maybe we would think, oh, oh, you know, that might be wrong or something. Well, it might be, but if you don't even try, if you don't even entertain the idea, yeah. So the, the age of reason or enlightenment was, the, was actually this, the downplaying of the word of God and the raising of the spirit of man. Right, and you, the fruit of that you can see, like in the French Enlightenment, which results in the French Revolution, where they overthrow the monarchy and they institute institutes. What, what were the three themes of uh, liberty, fraternity, equity, which should sound familiar to yeah. you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, like we're gonna live yeah. as if we matter most and God doesn't matter at all. Co-intentional by the devil. Hmm. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, and it was, taught, it was taught then in the universities, but the universities were also the places that they were also the seminaries. Mm-hmm. So they were teaching the next generation of pastors. We encountered this in our, in our church body, that we had pastors being trained, especially um, in the universities of Germany before or after World War II, um, and they were taught that none of it was true and that everything was a myth. The whole scripture was a myth. Yeah. Right, and then we ended up having something called the Battle for the Bible. You probably heard that, or Seminex is the consequence oh. of that. Yeah, and, the, and the, they walked out. Now, of course, they said it was all a big misunderstanding, except they went and became part of the formation of the ELCA, um, and we can see actually the fruit of the teaching of those pastors that walked out in the ELCA, where they don't believe any of it. The, the people don't either, because they're they're taught that none of it matters. So, I mean, that's a Okay, we, we did a long historical overview there. But what happens is reason takes over. And it's not reasonable to say that, well, like Jesus could appear at one, more than one place at the same time. Like, that's not reasonable. Nobody can do that in their body. You're like, well, yeah, of course not. <laughs> no, you're right. Except he's also true God. And we're like, well, how does that make sense? As I read yesterday in the, uh, in the devotion, which was a little convoluted, I, I was a little confused by the end, which happens. Uh, but the, the assertion of the formula of Concord, one of our confessions, is that after the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, the doctrine of the Incarnation is, is the greatest and most mysterious thing that we teach. That Christ is both God and man. Right? Now, it, it's great, but it's also mysterious. Which means we can, we can seek to say what the Bible says about it, but we can't go any farther than that. Well, I think to your point, Vicki, is that because of things being so mysterious, then we don't want to say anything at all because for fear of saying the wrong thing or, or trying to say, you know, trying to explain things that can't be explained, then we're just not even going to explain it. Um, but seeing Christ in the Old Testament, I mean, that's his own direction to us. So um, I'm going to do that in the first like two paragraphs of the sermon. I'm going to give you lots of examples um, of how we read the Bible, but um, it's not a new thing, but it's new to us. It's new to us. It's not new to our church. It's not new to the Lutheran Confession. It's not new to the art of interpretation throughout the history of the scriptures. Um, Luther does the most brilliant job of this. If you read really what was his, I think his magnum opus, um, he said two things should be preserved that he wrote, maybe three, bondage of the will, freedom of the Christian, and his Genesis lectures, which were over a span of about 10 years because he was quite ill the last 15, 12, 15 years of his life. Um, the Genesis lectures, it's eight volumes. There, we have copy, you can borrow. Um, it's eight volumes going through Genesis, uh, but he does this all the time. He says that Jacob, um, when he, he builds the altar, Bethel, and then he, he rejoices in the gift of the Messiah who is to come, whose name is Jesus. And you're like, what? Jacob didn't worship Christ? What are you talking about? But that, Luther's like, that's the consequence of what Jesus says. They didn't know him by name, but they knew him. 
and that they met with him. And they didn't have any problem. Jacob didn't have any problem understanding he was wrestling with God. And we're like, oh, that couldn't have been God. And it's like, well, yeah, and so unless God comes in human flesh, then you could wrestle with him, right? Okay. All right. Thank, good question. The cherubim were 10 cubits. The cherubim in the, the big statue ones were 10 cubits, which is roughly 18 feet. Yeah, each of their, their wings were... 18 feet. Yeah, that's like... We, we should put some in here. We should. Yes, no, I know. They're terrifying. I know. These are not, these are not little precious moments. Ooh. Cherubim. All right, so the spirit also set him on his feet, ah, lifted me up and brought me into the inner court and behold, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Again, we've seen this before. Tabernacle with Moses, temple with Solomon. All right. Uh, so there's a difference between prostration and mm -hmm. being stood on your feet to face someone with your eyes. Well, here, yeah, and he's, well, he's moving him, right? He's carrying him along. And we've talked about that. It happens in church here. Um, we don't do it as often as we could as far as like processions, but we do it at baptism. I start at the back and we move to the front, right? And it's the spirit is carrying you to the font. That's the same idea, right? From, from outside, from the world into the life of the church. We try to demonstrate that physically, but there you go. From there, from the uh, inner court, he can study the altar, which is what we're going to look at probably next time. Then uh, he'll be brought back to the East Gate after he gets a chance to study the altar. So the rest of this chapter is really focused on the altar. It's on the altar. We've, we already did the tour of all the other stuff, right? The gates and the windows and the vestibules and the, whatever the things are. The rooms for washing sacrifices and the guard rooms. And <laughs> um, but he wants to give our attention to the, ultimately here to the altar. I wonder why. <laughs> All right, well, that's what we're going to talk about. All right, so verse 6 through 9. Let's do 6 through 9. Because there's a lot here. <laughs> and I heard him speaking to me from the temple while a man stood beside me. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. No more shall the house of Israel defile my holy name. They are their kings. By their harlotry tree, or with the carcasses of their kings in their high places. And they shut their threshold by my threshold, and their doorpost by my doorpost. With a wall between them and me, they defiled my own name by the abominations which they committed. Therefore I have consumed them in my anger. Now let them put their harlotry tree and the carcasses of their kings far away from me, and I will dwell in their midst forever. Okay. <laughs> Whew. Um, there's a, quite a few things that we probably need to discuss here, I think. Um, I heard him speaking to me from the temple. Oh, no problem. God's talking to me. That happens all the time, right? Uh, mm, not exactly. And then a man stood beside me, which seems like an odd note, doesn't it? It's like, because okay, the man said to me, and I like how New King James capitalizes he, so I'll tell you who the man is. Yeah. Um, but that's it. That's the only time you hear about there's the man. The rest of the time, it's God speaking. But here, just this little note, it's the man speaking. So if the man's speaking, then it's God speaking. And you could take that any number of ways. Um, I suggested, I think, on here, this could be mouth, the God's mouthpiece, the spoken word of God, the pre-incarnate Christ again, John 1. No problem there. Or it could be an angel. That's fine, too. Um, although it's listed as a man. I think, mm, this is my own like speculation here, I think Ezekiel didn't know what to do with this. <laughs> Because he did not know, yet know God would become human flesh, right? So he's like, there's a man here and he's talking, but it's God's word. So that's it. I'm going to keep going on because <laughs> I can't explain how that, what, what's that all about? So again, these are like the breadcrumbs that are left throughout the Old Testament that lead us to Christ. And so that when Christ comes, actually, it's not all that surprising to us. If we know the scriptures, that is the Old Testament. And that's one of the things that I think Ezekiel, uh, why this study has been, well, it's been helpful for me. I hope it's been helpful for you, is to see that a lot of the language, especially Revelation, but even in John's gospel, is not all that um, surprising, actually, given the themes that are presented to us here in Ezekiel. Um, but if we don't know Ezekiel, then John will sound kind of crazy and, and nutball, like he's off his rocker. Yeah, this goes all the way back to chapter 1, where um, the, the 
that the person uh, above the likeness of the throne um, has the likeness of human flesh. Correct. Yeah, we had it before. Again, this is kind of a recap. But now that now that the city's been destroyed, all right, this, this is actually an important point. Is I think I wrote it on here somewhere that Ezekiel isn't trying to drive, get you back to out of exile, back to Jerusalem, and to rebuild the temple and set it up again. Never mind the dimensions wouldn't fit on the Temple Mount. We've talked about that a few times. Um, that's never that's not even the goal here at all. That we would restore the temple that, that was torn down. Because, as Ezekiel has confessed, who tore down that temple? Who was the one that was responsible for sending them into exile? This is all God's work. Yeah. So he's taking our attention off of the things that came before, now that a new thing is coming, right? And ultimately, he, our attention then will be fixed on Christ, who is the temple not made with hands. All right. So, uh, son of man, this is uh, this place... This is the place of my throne and my footstool. Now that language should sound familiar. Psalm 110, Psalm 110 right? The Lord said to my Lord, sit, my right sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool. So it's his footstool, and the earth is described as the footstool of God. <laughs> uh, we're under God's feet, right? That's, that's a way of saying he's Lord. <laughs> All right, you, you are his uh, royal subjects. Um, in humility, but also it's his throne. So now we have the temple being described as, as his throne. Now that was true before. The mercy seat, seat, what do you do? What do you put on a seat? Your posterior, right? You sit on it. <laughs> so the Lord sat on, the, on between the cherubim or on the wings of the cherubim. Uh, you can descri- it's described both ways, I think. Um, so, but it's both. This temple is both. Um, and I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Now that's an interesting promise because that draws us back to a king, doesn't it? King David, right? The promise of the king that would reign forever. And if this is his throne and reigning. So this guy talking is the son of man, or he's talking to the son of man, but he's, that would make, if he's saying he's the fulfillment of the promise to David, then that makes him the son of, huh, who? Who? Son of David, he's the promise fulfilled. That's what he's saying. And no more shall the house of Israel defile my holy name, nor they nor their kings. And now this is referring to the son of David, but not Jesus, son of David, but Solomon. Because this is the problem with, with the temple made by Solomon. Remember, David says, I want to make a temple for you, uh, you know, a permanent house. And God's like, no, 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 you don't. <laughs> the tabernacle's fine. He's like, no, 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 I, well, you, you need a house like, I need, like my house. David had already built his own palace. And he built the temple right next to the palace. And of course, we know the kind of things that David does in the palace. Like when he's on the roof and he sees the lady out bathing, right? That's right next door. I mean, he can just walk from his roof onto, into the court of the temple. It's part of the same complex. Which is why the problem here, <laughs> when they set... Their threshold by my threshold. We're literally door to door, right? And their doorpost to my doorpost, the wall between, we even share a wall. They share walls, the two complexes, both the temple and the... Uh, then when they do the thing in their house, they're defiling the temple as well. Which is what's different here is that with this temple, you don't dwell next door, you dwell in it. Right? And inside the temple, there is no abomination. It's only outside those thick walls. Remember, we read the walls. They were 10 cubits wide, I think, too, as well, right? Yeah, so the whole point of Ezekiel has been the separation of the profane from the sacred. And you are separated from the profane, and you're made sacred. You're made holy in the forgiveness of sins, right? And you're brought in to dwell now in the tabernacle, or now in the temple, actually. You're dwelling in the temple, which ultimately is Christ and his body. Separated, right? And this idea that Solomon, especially, because Solomon's wickedness was far exceeded David's, Solomon had how many wives and concubines? I don't even remember. A thousand concubines and however many wives. Six hundred? Like, yeah, that's right next door to the temple. God doesn't notice. No, Ezekiel's like, not just Solomon, but the rest of the kings too. Right? And they did other weird things with the kings, apparently. Like, note their harlotry, right? So I'm just talking about Solomon. And with the carcasses of their kings in the high places. So they would take, they would take the king. This is what you do with kings. 
you bury the king and you build a church on the, around the remains of the king or an altar or whatever. That was a pagan thing to do. By the way, uh, Europe did it too. <laughs> so they would bury the king in the wall of the, of the nave. And the place where God alone is to dwell, they, instead, they would bury all their, their noble men. Or under the altar. Yeah. St. Peter's St. Peter, yep, yep. Yeah, so the remains are kept there. Now there's a way that you want to honor the one who, uh, pre- you know, God used to help preserve the church. I get that. But... Um, here it's saying that they were, they were actually worshipped because it's a high place, that's a place of worship. So the kings are being worshipped, which is defiling the holy name. Now we can flip this because um, here we have the consuming of them, right? And uh, again, I will dwell in the midst forever. But you could flip this because you have both the second commandment and the first petition, right? Which both have, both have to do with God's name. The second commandment is you shall not misuse or take the name of the Lord your God in vain. I like the old translation better, but so what? Uh, That's what they're doing. But the first petition is, this is how the Christian then prays, not don't, yeah, hallowed be thy name. And as we learned in the explanation, God's name is certainly holy in itself, but we pray in this petition that it may be kept holy among us also. How is God's name kept holy? To the key? When the word of God is taught in its truth and purity, and we as the people of God also lead holy lives, or children of God also lead holy lives according to it. All right, so that's what God's doing here. He's, that's the way to actually learn the commandments. The commandments are yes or prohibition against what you aren't to do, but they're also a promise as to what God's going to do to you and for you. He will make you his own. He will make his name holy amongst you. And that's why we can pray that in the Lord's prayer because he's promised to do it as well. All right. Although it's not entirely pleasant, the process of uh, making his name holy, if you've been uh, defiling it with your harlotry and your carcasses of kings. <laughs> yeah, that's pleasant. That's really pleasant language. Hey, yeah, this is really appropriate for Christmas. It's really appropriate for Christmas. Yeah, verse 7. Right, son of man, this is my, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Emmanuel. Very good. Yeah. The Lord, um, oh, by the way, John 1, verse 14. I usually just translate it on the fly differently. It says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. I usually just change it. Most, most years, Christmas Day, I say the word was made flesh and tabernacled amongst us so that you make the connection because the, it's the same word. It's the verb of the noun, right? When Christ takes on human flesh, it's actually the tabernacle, not made with hands, right? Um, there's something else that we want to talk about here, and this is connected to the sermon. Oh, I gave you way too many things to read. Oh, well, so it goes. Um, is that when we talk about types and shadows, which we've done a lot in Ezekiel, there's the horizontal ones, which you'll hear in the sermon today. So like um, Zechariah and Elizabeth are like Abraham and Sarah, right? Or Isaac and Rebecca. Right, who are also barren. So the barren couples who God gives life to, right? So you can see there's a pattern going on here horizontally. Uh, we don't talk a lot about the vertical patterns, that God patterns the things of heaven in the things of earth. That's actually what he says to Moses when he sets up the tabernacle, that the tabernacle is a copy of the things from above. Right? And I, while we don't have a command to do this, we talked about this maybe last week or the week before, I think it's still helpful for us to take what we read about the heavenly visions, whether it's Isaiah 6 or Ezekiel 40 to 48 um, or Revelation 21, 22 or whichever, and reflect that in both the way that we worship, but also the, 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 the way that we build, that we structure our facilities so that they too reflect the heavenly reality of what we now receive by faith, but we will see face to face. I mentioned this with like um, the lack of angels. We just don't have angels depicted. Some of our churches do, but well, we actually believe the angels are dwelling with us and praying and singing, right, with us. But we don't depict that, which would be a great teaching tool. It's not necessary, but it is certainly helpful. We should have some way of helping people understand that it is, mm-hmm. when we worship, we are technically in heaven in the presence of God. Yeah, and this would help... Um, you know, like, like to Vicky's point, this would help 
somebody come in and say, well, wait a minute, how, how is it that you can say all scripture testifies of Christ if you already are doing that in your teaching and if you're depicting that in the way that, you're, that your sanctuary is set up, right? That maybe, maybe on the front of the altar, you've seen this in some churches, they have the lamb with the seven seals from Revelation. But then what do we have on the altar is Christ's body and blood. And you're like, oh, so the lamb with the seven seals, that's Christ, right? You see how that works? Uh, look at, uh, this is Hebrews 9, verse 11. Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. All right, so you see, this is lesser to greater. But it's a copy. The things that God instituted of old are a copy of the things to come or the, thing, the eternal truth. Does that make sense? Okay. So the writer of the Hebrews does a great job of this. If you want more examples, there's some there. Um, what did I say? A pattern or model or a miniature of the repeated temple. Turn the page. Um, we do want to note this important truth here. The ark is omitted from Ezekiel's vision. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. And that's something that would be striking to Ezekiel. Like, wait a minute, where's the ark? Because that God was present with his people on the ark, with the ark, whether it was the tabernacle or the temple, it was the ark, right? Well, Jeremiah 3 prophesies that in messianic times, when the Messiah comes, the ark will not be remembered or missed. And Jerusalem will be Yahweh's earthly throne, and to it the nations will be gathered, all right? Um, after the destruction of the temple in 586, the ark was never replaced. We don't, there's only, there's just speculation as to what happened to it. We don't actually know. But from Ezekiel's standpoint here, what he's presenting is it doesn't actually matter. Because now, the dwelling place of God is with man in Christ, right? So he now returns to a new Jerusalem and a new eternal temple. The ark was the vehicle of Yahweh's presence in the Old Testament era. Now Yahweh promises to dwell himself in the midst of the children of Israel forever. This language of the ark is the language of the ark, but it's anticipating something superior and permanent, a promise fulfilled in Christ and consummated on the last day. This is what Jesus himself says in John 2, um, and who through his spirit makes us baptize believers in Christ, the living stones uh, in the temple of his body, which that's First Peter. Baptism is prefigured by the use of the name. We see the name of my holy name, my holy name that connects you to your baptism because where his name is, that's where he promises to dwell. So if he's put his name on you, then you are his dwelling place and the glory of the Lord fills you, which is what happens during Epiphany, right? As Christ comes to fill you with his light, all right? Jesus is the one bearer of God's saving name, the only savior through whom we have access to the father. All right, and we already mentioned the first petition and second commandment. Um, all right, we already talked about the next paragraph, eight and nine. I got ahead of myself, but that's okay. Talking about the defiling of the temple because of what the kings did next door. <laughs> All right, but that will never happen again. And then um, we want to do, do we, can we do it? Yeah, we have five minutes. We can do it. We can do it. 10 through 12. Here, I'll scroll up a little bit more. And you, son of man, describe to the house of Israel the temple and its appearance and plan that they may be ashamed of their iniquity. And if they are ashamed of all that they have done, portray the temple, its arrangement, its exit, and its entrances, and its whole form, and make known to them all its ordinances and all its laws, and write it down in their sight, so that they may observe and perform all its laws and all its ordinances. This is the law of the temple. The whole territory round about on the top of the mountain shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the temple. All right. So, and by law... Um, the word there is Torah. I don't particularly like translating it as law because, instruction. well, yeah, instruction. Um, you could say law gospel if you want. So now, verse ten is very interesting because this is a back. This is backfilling everything that's just happened. 
and I, had to, I told you this in advance so that, because I knew what was, he was going to say eventually, is that the reason why all of that was described for us with the walls and the gates and the doorways and the entrances and the dimensions was that we'd be ashamed of our iniquities, that our lives are not ordered in the way that God's holy dwelling is. Not yet, right? It's be, God is ordering your life by the forgiveness of sins. He's reordering it, actually, setting it back into order. Right? So we're just to look at the temple and say, this is how God is perfectly square. <laughs> That's funny. Um, but, you know, everything is, is laid in place, and there's, no, there's nothing that's out of place. And we're not like that. So can we dwell there, right? So we're to measure the pattern. And then we'll be ashamed as we compare ourselves to the perfect, you know, to, to God. Um, and that's why we are, we're actually to take the time to learn about the temple and its dimensions and its architecture and its arrangement, its entrances and exits, its design, its ordinance, all its forms and laws. Here's Ezekiel saying, take the time to go back and read Exodus and the design and temple of not only the, temp, of the tabernacle, but also the ordering of the priesthood and the sacrifices. Go read Leviticus because they, they will, it will show you your sin, and lead, but lead you then to come to Christ for mercy, ultimately. Now, if you haven't read Leviticus that way, it's a fun exercise. Well, maybe we'll do that someday. But it's another long book, so we don't want to do that next. <laughs> that was, that was a fun idea. Yeah, it's fun. I did it very quickly that time, I think, like in 10 weeks. But um, it gets a little bit pedantic after a while. But, um, but even the, the temple set up by Solomon and all of its dimensions and its, and its accoutrement, right? all of its design features, and that, that's all actually given for the sake of faith both to confess your sins and then to turn to Christ for forgiveness. That's what Ezekiel is saying. And you're like, okay, well then that's why those three chapters, 40, 41, 42, with all of it, the dimensions, all the design, that's why that was given? Yeah. Because it seemed a little boring and it took us too long to read. Let me say, but this is the reason for it. Um, and, and yeah, write it down in their sight, which Ezekiel did. That's what we're reading, <laughs> Right? So he's telling us why he wrote it down. So that they may keep its whole design, all its ordinances, and perform them. This is the word of the temple. That's probably just the best translation. The word of the temple, the Torah. All right. Um, I, I gave you some more on this here. Ezekiel, last paragraph on page two, is commanded to narrate or preach or describe. That's a weak word, but okay. Narrator preached the temple. In part, it connects the sanctuary structure with the history of salvation of which it is a part. All its laws, including the cultic ones, Leviticus, are subordinated to the narrative of creation, creation and redemption, meaningful as they contribute to the proclamation and sacramental distribution of the gospel. We've been taking pains to do this throughout all of Ezekiel. How does this confess Christ? How does it lead us to faith in Christ? How does it show us our sin for the sake of forgiveness of sins, etc.? Justification, the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting, all furnished as God's free gifts because of the atonement of Jesus Christ. The backspin is that eyes are open to the extent that adult, idolatrous spirituality has been a sacrilege. So as your sins are forgiven, of course you find out that you have sins that need forgiven. <laughs> you can't help that, right? Yeah, that's just part of the deal. Thus law and gospel preach together. Um, we also learn here that I don't think this is uniquely given to Ezekiel. I think this is probably part of the entire priesthood is that catechetical instruction was part of their duty, not only to perform the rites, make the sacrifices, but as they're doing that to narrate it to the people, right? Fathers and sons, women and children, that they would hear, he would say, I'm taking the sacrifice and I'm offering it. Or maybe they have actually liturgical words. Behold the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He says, while he sat making the sacrifice, like we do. The words of the liturgy are describing what's actually happening for you, right? So I would suggest the priests were doing the same thing, although there's not a lot of evidence of that, but anyway. Um, so they would be giving the theology of worship as they were going along. Uh, da, 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 da. Such instruction is not only verbal, verbal, but also includes the written text, like the book of Ezekiel. So we might like a drawing or a sketch of what's happening here, but everything about the temple is a sermon illustration that unites for God's people what he has done and continues to do for them, their justification, and with what they will do in grateful response and become by his grace, their sanctification. 
So instead of re- trying to rebuild the temple after exile, not they did, and we have to deal with that, but um, I don't think that's what Ezekiel is advocating, or hastening in the millennium when they're going to set up a new temple and start sacrificing again in Jerusalem, which some Christians think would be a good idea. Go figure. The here is to contemplate the implications of the temple and to live as such by the power of God at work in them. So this Torah of the temple is not a new covenant to be implemented by Israel, but the renewal of the Torah revealed first to Moses and developed in this revelation and ultimately fulfilled in Christ. Again, I would translate Torah as law gospel or the word, if you prefer. So this is Ezekiel telling you that everything we've been reading, what we've been doing, he actually now, finally, chapter 43 says, that's what you should be doing. How does this lead me to faith in Christ? How does this point to my salvation? Now, granted, he doesn't know his name, but, he, but that's the purpose, including describing architectural features of a building that doesn't even exist, which seems kind of strange, right? And, and like Ethan pointed out, I think, um, what a great text for, for Christmas Day, where you hear the word was made flesh and tabernacle amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's the temple not made with hands. He's here with us. Everything that Ezekiel told us to get ready for and prepared us for, we've been reading 43 chapters for the last two year, or year, over a year, was for the sake of Christmas Day. You think people reading John would think, oh, this is temple language. No, I don't think so. Not unless you're taking the time to study the temple. All right, so there you go. We did it.